Good morning, family. My name is Corey. I'm the student life director and the worship leader here at Harmony Community Church. And let me be the first to say today that we are blessed that you are here. We are honored that you chose to spend your morning with us. So do us a favor. Go ahead and comment below. Uh, let us know that you're watching. Start a watch party. I will give you five seconds. Okay, maybe that was a little less than five seconds, but you know what I'm saying. Go ahead and get engaged. Uh, we are so ready to be able to see you guys face to face. And there may be a little secret. We may be making an announcement later on in the service. So once again, thanks for hanging out with us this morning uh, as we continue to go through the book of Ecclesiastes.
holy, holy, holy. You're holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. When the music fades And all is stripped away And I simply come Longing just to bring Something that's of worth That'll bless your heart I'll bring you For song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear. You're looking into my heart. And I'm coming back to the heart of worship. And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus King of endless worth No one could express How much you deserve Though I'm weak and poor It's all I have is yours Every single breath song in itself is not what you have required you search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart and I'm coming back to To the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus
right, hey everybody, Dr. Danny Purvis, lead pastor of Harmony Community Church. Welcome once again to our online at home version of Harmony Community Church's weekly worship service. Uh, I'm hoping uh, for, uh, for not too terribly much longer that we will, uh, that we will have to do this, but we'll, we'll talk about that here in just a minute. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're nice and relaxed. It is going to be interesting, isn't it, when we get back to meeting together, uh, how many people are going to show up in their pajamas or with their, with their, uh, with their breakfast. It's going to be interesting getting back to uh, some sense of normalcy when we, uh, when we get the opportunity to do that. But uh, I hope more than anything what this has been able to communicate to us and show us and and, uh, and reveal to us is, is that truly church is not a building. I mean, when you look at the word that's translated as church in the original language, it's not a building. It means the called out ones, the people who are called out, the believers who are called out from the world in order to live and to preach and to teach and to bear witness to the things that God has done for us and continues to do for us. So I hope that we've been able to see that. I think that's a valuable lesson that the church hopefully has learned during this time period and that we won't just automatically shift back into that mode once we are able to start meeting together, which I am anxious uh, to do, of course. But I hope you're doing well, and I hope you're uh, nice and relaxed and, uh, and ready to engage God's Word here just a little bit. One, one housekeeping uh, item I know I had said last week that I, I really wanted to make the announcement today of 100% of certainty when we will be meeting again. We've still got a few I's to dot and a few T's to cross, but if I were you, I would keep June 7th circled on your calendar. I not, uh, it, we're, it's not 100% now. It's very close to that. I would expect here in the next, really probably the next few days, next week at the most, that we will be able to, uh, to launch an announcement, uh, reopening worship services. And um, what I've said before, I continue to say, we'll, we'll send this message out email, we'll get on Facebook, we'll do whatever we need to do to make sure everybody understands. But I also want you to understand something as well. If you are not comfortable coming back to the worship service, please don't come. It's fine. Don't let anybody try to pressure you into coming. If you want to come and wear a mask, that's fine. If you want to come and not wear a mask, that's fine too. Whatever you need to do in order to feel comfortable uh, is, is fine with me. It's, it should be, and it, is, it will be fine with all of us. So don't feel pressured to come back right away. If you want to hang back and wait a few more weeks, a few months. I, it doesn't matter to me. That is completely up to you. But we do have a lot of folks. The surveys have come back and overwhelmingly people are ready to get back together. I'm ready to get back together. Uh, there'll be some differences, obviously. We're, you know, nobody. I don't think we're going to be doing a whole lot of hugging and handshaking and all that kind of good stuff. We will take uh, prudent uh, cautions as we, as we open up. Again, once we make that decision, uh, completely 100% final, we will tell you some of the things that we're going to do to help, uh, to help with this process and maybe to alleviate some anxiety with folks who are wondering whether they should come back or not. But that is completely 100% up to you. It's like I said, I think it's going to be June 7th. That's what we're shooting for. And as soon as we get that final answer, I promise you, I will let you know. So let's go ahead and continue on in our journey through Ecclesiastes. You know, after, after today, I think we only have five messages left in the, in the book of Ecclesiastes. What an extraordinary, amazing journey this has been. I will be honest with you, I've read Ecclesiastes before. I've not studied Ecclesiastes before because, you know, there's a big difference between reading God's Word and really delving into it. This is the first time I've ever really delved into it. I was familiar with it, obviously. I had read it before. But this is the first time that I've ever really gone into in this kind of depth. And I had no idea a lot of this stuff was in here. And one of the things that has been so amazing about this, and as we continue to see, as we move along, is one of the things that Solomon is trying to do here under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is he's trying to point out one of the, one of the most successful tactics that our adversary has, and that is his um, um, ability or desire or his strategy to take the good things that God has done, the good constructs, the good ideas, the good... Uh, um, thoughts, the good, doctrine, all the things that, that come from God that are good, our adversary wants to make counterfeit versions of those things. So if God does something great, like which he does, like he, he created sex, right? We, I think we all can pretty much agree that's a pretty good thing he created. He created it within the confines of marriage. The adversary comes and says, no, 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 it's not relegated just to marriage. It's relegated to anybody under any circumstances as sex before, during, and after marriage. It, it really doesn't matter. And so he takes what the, the good things that God gives us 
and he counterfeits them. And I hope that you've seen in the first six chapters of that, he gave us the counterfeits. He talked about those things that maybe can even on the surface sound a little good at times, but they are not. Sometimes what sometimes his counterfeits are so closely resemble, uh, resembling the truth that it, all it takes is just a little deviation from the standard of God's truth to make it destruction, destructive and harmful. And in some cases, it's very obvious. So one of the things that, that this book has been so good for me personally, what it's been so good at doing is pointing out and showing me those strategies and showing me in the first six chapters these counterfeit versions of the good things that God has given us. Then he shifted gears, right? He, in, in, from chapter 7 to the end of the book, he's going to talk th about the true aspects of God. He's going to talk about, he's already talked about the counterfeit things that the world uh, gives us, the counterfeit ideals and, and, and things like that. So now he's going to juxtapose those against the actual true elements of, of who God is, what He is giving us, and how much He loves us. So if you've, uh, if you've been uh, keeping score at home, you know the last two weeks we've been talking about, Solomon talking about true wisdom as opposed to in I think it was chapter 2 where he's talking about the world's wisdom, the counterfeit wisdom, which is no wisdom at all. So we've, we've talked about the last two weeks, true wisdom. This week, week we're going to talk about true peace. Next week, we're going to talk about true trust. And then he finishes up with true living, true diligence, true speaking, and true worship. So he's taking the first half of the book and telling us the counterfeit things. He's taking the second half of the book and he's telling us the true godly things that God wants to give us and, um, and trying to expand our understanding of the good things that God wants to give us. What happens when we come to faith in Him? That we no longer have to rely on the counterfeit things of the adversary because we now have access to the true elements of God's goodness. And the one He's done today, and the one He's talking about today, is, is really, uh, really extraordinary. Because there is, um, there, I think there's a misunderstanding about this word because this is a word that, of course, the world uses, but in a drastically different way. And what Solomon is talking to us about today is the understanding of what true peace actually is. He does this really interesting thing in chapter 7. He was talking about wisdom in, in verses uh, 1 through 14, I believe is what we've passed, uh, covered the last, uh, the last two weeks. He, he, he's, he spoke about this idea of true wisdom. And then at, at verse 15, he, it's almost like he kind of steps away from that train of thought and he, he, he tells us, let me tell you about all of the really bad things that I've seen. Let me tell you about the not good things that I have experienced in my life and how God's peace supersedes all of those bad things that we can live in, be in, be surrounded by, even engage them and still be able to have the peace which Scripture teaches us is the past, uh, is, is surpasses all understanding. So when we talk about this understanding of peace, it's really interesting because what is the, besides the redemption and forgiveness of sin that we experience while we're on this planet, the pinnacle of our relationship with God is what? It, it's when we go to heaven, right? The scripture shares that with us over and over and over again. It's, and it's sort of, to be honest with you, it's, it's sort of delayed gratification. So we are promised throughout scripture, again, over and over and over again, you know, hang on, because when you draw your last breath on this planet, you're going to wake in. Go to Revelation. Read Revelation and read the passages describing what heaven's going to, be, going to look like, going to be like. And then walk away with the understanding that even then it seems almost indescribable. It is, it is beyond our ability to understand. Paul even wrote uh, one time regarding that. That if we as believers only have hope in this life, that there is no resurrection and there is no heaven after this, then we are more than any other people on the planet to be pitied. Think about that for a second. Of all the people that we have pity on in this world, Paul wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that if there is no resurrection, if there is no heaven, if there is no afterlife for us that God has described in His Word, then there's no group of people on the planet who should be pitied more than us who actually believe that. So this is an extraordinary aspect of our relationship with God, this promise of heaven. Over and over again, we're told, you know, I know some bad things are going to happen here. I know there's some terrible things you're going to be involved in that are going to surround you, that are going to uh, engage you in some way, shape, or form. But ultimately, when it's all said and done, you get to spend eternity with the Father. What a glorious promise that is. But as I said, that is sort of delayed gratification. But that doesn't mean that there aren't things that He gives us 
to be able to give us temporal gratification. That things that we can enjoy uh, as being uh, a children of His, as being His followers here on this planet now. And of all the things that He does to give us uh, and, and all of the things that He has blessed us with, I will tell you, I think peace ranks it, it's probably pretty close to the top of the list for me. That understanding that we can be in a world that is completely surrounding us with chaos and still somehow be at peace with all of the horrific things around us is absolutely amazing. uh, Jesus in John chapter 14 uh, in verse 27 says something really interesting here. I want to uh, read very quickly related to this idea of peace. John 14 and 27. This is Jesus speaking to the disciples and then, of course, by extension to us. Now listen to what he says here. Peace I live, I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Now listen to that sentence. He's saying... It's, it, because he keeps going further with his explanation. He says, I give you peace. And then he says, no, it's not just peace. It's my peace. Oh, and it's not just peace and my peace. It's my peace that the world can't give you. So he goes on and makes sure that we understand that this is supernatural peace. This isn't when someone, when you're listening to a non-believer, when you listen to a very regular, normal, average, everyday, secular person talk about how they want, they want there to be peace on this planet, that's not the peace that's, that Jesus is talking about. Because that peace is not peace at all. It's a counterfeit. It's, it's, it's always going to be dependent on whatever external circumstances happen to be going on at the time. That's not the peace that Jesus is talking about here. And listen to what he says is the reason why he gives us the peace. This is what is, to, to me, one of the most extraordinary aspects of this. Let me read it to you again. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be Afraid. Afraid of what? Afraid of anything. That's the benefit that we have in being able to engage and have placed upon us, within us, this peace in order to be able to live in the world in which we are called to live. And that is we do the reason one of the main reasons he gives this to us is so that we do not have to be afraid. And when you leave a sentence like that and say, well, he just doesn't want us to be afraid, the next obvious question is afraid of what? Again, the answer is is very clear from Scripture. Afraid of anything. Jesus said, only worry about those that can harm the soul or the spirit. Don't worry about those who can harm the body. It's interesting that he uses those two as the example. Harm the body. That's the thing. There's no more stronger drive probably in any other human being on the planet than what? Self-preservation. The idea of staying alive, not being hurt, not engaging in suffering. So he said, look, don't worry about that. That's not what you have to worry about. You have to worry about only somebody that can harm the soul or harm the spirit. But since my spirit belongs to him and since his spirit lives in me and my soul is not my own anymore, it belongs to him, there's nobody that can harm my soul or my spirit, which means what Jesus in essence is saying there is, if you're a believer, if you have come to faith in Christ, you don't have to be afraid of anything. You don't have to be afraid of pain and suffering. You don't have to be afraid of injustices, persecution. You don't have to be afraid of pandemics. You don't have to be afraid even to die. We should not, as believers, be enslaved to the fears that are all around us in the world. The Scripture is telling us that that is a supernatural peace that gives us the ability to not be afraid of these things. You know, most of you know this, or some of you know this, uh, maybe not all of you, but I'm a huge fan of The Simpsons. I'm, I'm a, the, the animated TV show, The Simpsons. At least for the first 13 seasons. After that, it drops off pretty fast. But up to that point, it was a really good show. There was a, an interesting episode one time where a hurricane hit Springfield. And the only home that was destroyed was the home of Ned Flanders. Now, if you know the show at all, you know that Ned Flanders is really the only true believer represented in Springfield. Um, he, he's, uh, you know, of course, they poke their fun at him and they have a little fun. But things generally work out for Ned. It was really a fascinating uh, episode because here was Ned who is faithful to God and, and loves the Lord and, and really is a, just a genuinely good guy. And then his house is the only one that gets destroyed by the hurricane. But there's this really interesting scene that happens right after the hurricane clears out. 
The Simpsons, of course, they live next door to the Flanders, if you don't know. They, they come outside to see, what they, you know, to just examine the damage. They see that the Flanders' house has been destroyed, and they see Ned over there by himself. They don't see his wife or they don't see his kids. So Ned immediately starts calling out for his wife and kids to try to find out where they are. Well, his wife has been blown up into a tree. So she's actually in the, in the crook of a tree up there. And when she sees him and he sees her, of course, they have this great reunion. Then they have her saying something really interesting. She said, it was terrifying, Nettie. I thought I was headed for the eternal bliss of paradise. Isn't that interesting? So here she is as a believer, what Paul said, for me to live as Christ, but to die as gain, this idea that we've got something better waiting for us. And she, she, the writers actually had in her, you know, placed in her, in her mouth these words that, um, well, I know that if I die, I'm going to be in a way better place than I am now. And somehow that's supposed to be terrifying. I see the point they're trying to make. I think they're a little off with it. Obviously, they're a secular TV show. But it does make an interesting point, And that is how many of us are actually enjoying the peace and the lack of fear that we should be able to have from that peace in the world in which we live today. How many of us are still shackled by fear? That is not God's intent. That's one of the reasons why he gave us this piece to begin with, so that we would not have to be afraid of these things. And that's what Solomon is trying to tell us here in these passages. He's about to give us a list of about four things here where he says, I know these are bad things. I know these are hurtful things. I know these are harmful things. But these are the things that even though they exist both in the world and with us, and that's key to remember as we're going through this, we still can have peace in Him. The peace to not only live but actually thrive in a world in which these things are actually happening. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to read the passage as always. We'll pray. And then we're going to look at the four things that Solomon has listed here that we can have peace in the midst of. They're all universal. Every single one of us experienced this have experienced this in our lives, probably multiple times in our lives. In fact, a lot of them we experience every single day of our life. So how is it that we can live in peace when all of these things are so surrounded by us and sometimes even engage us and we engage it in ways that we wish we didn't? Well, let's take a look at the passages, the verses, and then we will uh, move into that, that part of the message. So we are again in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, and we're going to begin in verse 15. And here's Solomon writing, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. In my vain life, I have seen everything. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in his evil doing. Be not overly righteous, and do not make yourself too wise. Why should you destroy yourself? Be not overly wicked, neither be a fool. Why should you die before your time? It is good that you should take hold of this. And from that, withhold not your hand. For the one who fears God shall come out from both of them. Wisdom gives strength to the wise man more than ten rulers who are in a city. Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Do not take to heart all the things that people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you. Your heart knows that many times you yourself have cursed others. All this I have tested by wisdom. I said... I will be wise, but it was far from me. That which has been is far off and deep, very deep. Who can find it out? I turned my heart to know and to search out and to seek wisdom and the scheme of things and to know the wickedness of folly and the foolishness that is madness. And I find something more bitter than death. The woman whose heart is snares and nets and whose hands are fetters. He who pleases God escapes her, but the sinner is taken by her. Behold, this is what I found, says the preacher, while adding one thing to another to find the scheme of things which my soul has sought repeatedly, but I have not found. One man among a thousand I found, but one woman among all these I have not found. See, this alone I found, that God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the opportunity that you've given us once again to delve into your word, Lord. And I know that as we are going through unprecedented times in our, in our country with um, being forced to stay home and being forced not to go to work, and some people with business being forced to close their businesses, it's really easy to get afraid. It's really easy to let that fear spiral out of control in our hearts and our minds. But one of the benefits to being your child 
to coming to faith in you is that you give us the peace so that we do not have to be afraid. And the reason we don't have to be afraid, Lord, is because if the absolute worst happens to me, the absolute worst thing that could ever possibly happen happens to me, the end result is I get to be with you forever. If that's the truth, and it is according to your word, then what in the world do I have to be afraid of? And so I pray, Father God, that you will let that peace wash over us. For those who might be watching here who, are, who do not belong to you, Lord, they will never know that peace apart from you. I pray that you open their hearts and their minds here this morning to hear the truth of who you are. The understanding that Jesus died on a cross for our sin, raised again on the third day. And if we confess and believe him, then you will save us and give us that peace. For an amazing of all the gifts you have given us, Lord, peace, the ability to live peacefully in a world full of chaos, in a world full of sin, in a world full of unrighteousness is one of the greatest things you have ever given us. I pray for those who are listening here this morning, who know you, who belong to you, that we will engage, embrace, and understand that peace. And for those who don't know you, they will come to know you so they can engage the peace that, peace that surpasses all understanding. Clear in our hearts and our minds from anything that might be distracting us from you here this morning. May you be lifted up and glorified. May people be drawn into you. For it's in the precious name of Jesus I pray. Amen. So let's go ahead and take a look at these four things that Solomon says we can have peace in the midst of. And like I said, these are all universal. As I read them, you're going to understand, and, and, and I guarantee you, but as, I as I was looking at them, it was going through my mind how many times I had experienced these things. So these, these are common to every single one of us, and, and they're, they're, they can be painful, and they can be disruptive, and they can be a lot of different things, but we can still manage to have peace in the midst of them. And the first thing that he's telling us that we can have peace in the midst of is injustice. Look at verse 15. In my vain life, I have seen everything. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in his evil doing. Injustice is one of our, even from a secular standpoint, is an extremely important construct to us. We are constantly talking. You cannot go a day without listening to the radio, reading an article, listening to the news, watching the news, hearing somebody talk, where somebody's not talking about some level of injustice that is happening in the world today. It completely surrounds us. Every time we look someplace, we can see an example of some level of injustice. That's what Solomon was talking about here. A righteous man dies, and not only is the, is the bad guy surviving, he's actually using, his evil doing is actually helping to prolong his life. That is the very essence of injustice. So he's talking, that's what he starts out talking about. How are we supposed to live as believers if we've come to faith in Christ? How do we live in a world that's full of injustice? Well, you have to understand what that really means because if the world, start, the minute the world starts talking about whether something is just or unjust, they're not talking about justice in any way, shape, or form. Our total depravity, our original sin, the very unrighteousness that we are born into guarantees us at least one thing. It guarantees us a lot of things. But in this context, guarantees at least one thing, and that is we never will be able to understand what true justice is and what true injustice is because we're going we're gonna to rate justice and injustice on our personal likes and, and shortcomings and strengths and everything else. It's not going to be based on God almost in any way shape or form. We see this in politics all the time, which is why it's a spectator sport for me. I am loving this stuff. It is nothing but complete and utter foolishness. No matter what side of the aisle, no matter what your political ideology is, you take one political, look, you know what your definition, I guarantee you I know what your definition when it comes to, especially in this, in the, the current climate that we're in now, guarantee you your definition of justice and injustice depends on what letter is after the person's name who's experiencing that act. So if somebody, if something bad happens to somebody in your political party, it's unjust. But if the exact same thing happens to somebody of the other political party, that's just. That you know that's just the way we are, that's just who we are. And because of that, we'll never be able to experience and understand true justice or even injustice on this planet. And here's another thing we have to understand about that. God doesn't promise that. He makes a lot of promises in his word, a lot of them. 
But he never promises that there will be justice on this planet during our lifetime. There will be ultimate justice at the end when all things are said and done. And Jesus has come back and he sits as judge over everybody, the living and the dead. And all of that is judged. That's the only time true, complete justice will be done in the, over the entire planet. Other than that, I mean, are there times he intervenes? Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing there probably is. But for the most part, he promises us that there's going to be injustice. In the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus actually warns us about this. This is in Matthew chapter 5, verse 45. Let me back up to 44 and give you a little bit of context. That's where it starts. But I say, this is Jesus speaking. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be the sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he, meaning God, For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Now he's using euphemisms here. When Jesus is saying that God causes the sun to shine, that's a euphemism for allowing good things to happen. And what is he saying? God allows good things to happen to good people and to bad people. The word literally is is righteous, unrighteous and righteous. And then when he says he causes the rain to fall, which is a euphemism for bad things that happen to us, He lets the bad things happen to the just and the unjust, the righteous and the unrighteous. Sometimes good things happen to the unjust and bad things happen to the just. That is the essence of injustice. He promises us, he tells us that we are not going to see that on this planet. So as believers, we can't get wrapped around the axle. I I know people who just get jacked up all the time because of these real and perceived injustices in the world. And my thing is, what do you expect? What did, you, what did you expect? Do you really think they're going to, that God has ever in any way, shape, or form promised us that we'd have justice on this planet in the, in the years that we live, in the times that we live? I don't see that in Scripture at all. So what does He do instead? He gives us what? The peace to be able to live with those injustices. To be able not to just live, but to actually thrive in them. And I'm not saying, by the way, I'm not saying don't speak out and don't write your congressman if you think something's unjust. I'm not talking about that. I'm saying understand that there is no promise that God has given us that there will be complete justice on this planet while we are alive on this planet. In fact, he tells us the exact opposite and tells us to expect injustice. Injustice drives us completely insane. Sometimes we get so frustrated and so angry. That's because we're not engaging the peace that God has given us to be able to live through those things and to be at peace with them. Not like them. Nowhere in Scripture does it say we're supposed to like them. But to live with them and to exist with them and to be able to thrive and even have peace in the midst of this injustice is extremely important. But it's not just the, the injustice that we see around us that others have engaged in or that may have been done to us. Here's another aspect of this that we need to understand before we move on to these other three. That these things here that God is talking about, about giving us peace to live with them, it's not, it's not just that we're going to, as believers, we're sojourners here, and we are, uh, and, and uh, that we don't really belong here. This is not our home. All of that's true. And so, yes, part of it is giving us the peace to be able to live in a world in which we're surrounded by these things. But the other part of the peace, the one we don't like to talk about too much, but we desperately need even more, is the peace that He gives us to live with the injustices that we have done to other people. That is extremely important because every single one of us has done an injustice to someone else. Every single one of us. So it's not just a peace to live in the injustices around us, but it's the peace for us to be able to live in the fact that we have done injustices to others. Gives us the peace for us to be able to live with the memories of our own sin. We're going to talk about sin here in this in second point here in just a second, but I want us to make sure we get this before we move on. When God forgives our sin, the scripture is very clear. He separates it as far as the east is from the west. He tosses it into the sea of forgetfulness. He says, I will remember your sins no more, is what the scripture said. Other passages say blots out our sin as if it doesn't even exist. We, one of the curses that we have as human beings is memory. God chooses not to remember any of the things that we've done. That is, if I do something, if I did something last week, really kind of bad, 
and, and I know I'm forgiven and God has forgiven me and I've prayed about it and I've confessed and I've done all the things that, that I feel motivated to do for God's spirit to bring me back into a, into a right understanding of all of this. And then I'm praying the following week and I'm going to say, hey, yeah, remember when I did that thing last Tuesday? He's going to say, no, nope, I don't have an idea what you're talking about. Because he has chosen to forget them. He doesn't put them in this little back area so he can bring it back up to our memory later on when we do something else or we do the same thing over and over again, which so many of us have a tendency to do. Our adversary does that. He has a really good memory. And he is the one that keeps bringing that up. When we sin as a believer and God forgives our sin, it's as if they do not exist anymore, but we still have the memory of them. So we need peace to be able to live with that. I'm not talking about being comfortable with your sin. Do not hear that. I hate my sin. I am... I despise my sin. I don't want it anywhere near me, but we still struggle with that sin nature. Regardless of the fact if we've come to faith with Him, Scripture talks about that. We still struggle with that nature and will until we are with Him. So when we do that, when we engage in that sin, we're going to have to live with it somehow. And it's so difficult for us because we have a memory of it. God has forgotten it. We haven't. So what does He do? He gives us peace. The peace to be able to live with the fact that we have committed that sin. That we have, we have done the opposite of what He has called us to do. It's, it's extraordinary. All of this injustice that we see around us, the injustice that we have engaged in with others, we desperately need peace in order to be able to live with that. And that's what He has given us. Peace even in the midst of injustice. Number two, he has given us peace even in the midst of sin and unrighteousness. In verses 16 through 20, be not overly righteous. When he talks about this first, be not overly righteous, he's talking about the world's righteousness and the world's idea of wisdom. Not, not, it's the counterfeit wisdom, but we'll get to that. Be not overly righteous and do not make yourself too wise. Why should you destroy yourself? Be not overly wicked, neither be a fool. Why should you die before your time? It is good that you should take hold of this and from that withhold not your hand for the one who fears God shall come out of both of them. Wisdom gives strength to the wise man. Wisdom gives strength to the wise man more than 10 rulers who are in a city. And listen to verse 20. Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. That is the key aspect of this series of um, Verses here. He's trying to make us understand that not only do we live in a world that is completely enveloped in sin, and it has been since Adam and Eve had their little snack. This world has been completely enveloped in sin, so we're around it all the time. Again, you can't listen to a song or watch a movie or watch a news show or listen to the radio or do anything without seeing some representative of that sin. And because we see that sin so often, because that unrighteousness is around us all the time, it is very disconcerting. And it oftentimes leads us to the, I think, the false idea that we are living in the worst possible times right now. I've heard that before, that it's never never been worse than it is right now. Now, theoretically, that could be true because I've, I didn't live 3,000 years ago. So it's possible that this is the worst possible time that, that in existence. I, I don't think so, but I can see where we come to that conclusion. So let me, let me read something to you. Let me read you this quote. Now, this quote could have come from any grumpy, you know, 40 to 80 year old, 50 to 80 year old person that has access to, to social media. You could read this post anywhere on any kind of social media if you were to look hard enough. But here's the quote. The children now love luxury. They have bad manners. They have contempt for authority. They show disrespect for their elders and love chattering in place of exercise. Children are now tyrants, not the servants of their household. They no longer rise when elders enter the room. They contradict their parents. They talk all the time. They eat all the stuff on the table before anybody else gets a chance to eat. And they tyrannize their teachers. Like I said, you would probably not have to scan through a lot of social media posts until you found something that was very similar to this. What makes this particular quote different is that it was written by Socrates 400 years before Jesus was born when it could just as easily have been written and probably somewhere in social media was written either today or yesterday. You see the point we're trying to talk about here is that it has always been this way. And we see this pointed out from a scriptural standpoint in the book of Romans. 
when you listen to this particular passage here in Romans chapter 1, and there, there, there are several verses here, but I want to make sure that we get this right and understand this. Listen to what Paul was writing about this nature of us being surrounded by unrighteousness, surrounded by sin. For the wrath of God is revealed, this is a Romans, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the mortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in their lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations uh, for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women, consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men, and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They were full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness, they are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. That was 2,000 years ago. And many of us can see the same things happening over and over and over again around us. Because we are enveloped in a world. The entire world is under indictment for sin. Did you notice that passage? They not only do those things, but they applaud and approve of the ones who do them as well. And this is so turned upside down. We are in such a world steeped in unrighteousness and sin. It has become so normal to the world that the really good things that can be found in here, this is the stuff that's considered wrong. This is the stuff that's considered immoral. That's how upside down we are in this world. Where the Bible is treated as something wrong. The truths of God postulated in the scriptures are considered to be unrighteous, bad. We don't want anything to do with them. That's how, I mean, we are truly through the looking glass here from a spiritual standpoint. We are completely surrounded. So how in the world can we live in a world in which unrighteousness reigns as the norm? The only way we can is because of peace. The peace that God gives us, not only to live in the world that engages in sin, but also able to live with peace for the sin that we have committed, the sin that has been paid for, by the blood sacrifice of Jesus who died a cruel death on a cross and was raised again on the third day to pay for my sin. That sin that I do even now as a believer that I commit was taken care of 2,000 years ago. I still have to live with it. But this is how he helps me live with it, by giving me peace, not liking it, not dismissing it, not making it no big deal, understanding the true devastating nature of it, but giving me the peace to be able to live even though I still engage in sinful behavior from time to time. How extraordinary is that? The only way we can live in the world in which we live, the only way we can live with ourselves, the only way is the peace that He has given us, the supernatural peace that He has given us in the midst of sin and unrighteousness. Number three, He's given us peace in the midst of betrayal. And I don't want you to get hung up on the, on the formality of that word. We think betrayal. We think really big things. Even it's just as simple as somebody else letting you down. We've all been betrayed in some way, shape, or form. We've all been betrayed by people we care about in some way, shape, or form. We have betrayed others. We have let others down. 
in some way, shape, or form. In verses 21 through 22 of Ecclesiastes chapter 7, um, do not take to heart all the things that people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you. And your heart knows that many times you yourself have cursed others. What he's saying here is very clear. There are people who seem to be on your side, but if sometimes you listen to them long enough, you end up finding out they're not as loyal to you as you might have thought they were, that you really can't count on any other human being to be loyal to you no matter who they are, by the way. How do we live with that? The only way we can live with that kind of betrayal, especially when it is close to us, the only way we can live with people letting us down, especially those who are close to us, is through the peace that God has given us through His Son, Jesus Christ, because of His death, death, burial, and resurrection. When I was in the Navy, I did a lot of premarital counseling. I did a lot of marriage retreats and seminars. One of the things I really used to like to do, and, and, I, and don't misunderstand me, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to, to you know, suck all the fun out of marriage and, and love and all that other kind of stuff, but I, I really felt like it was incumbent upon me to make sure that married couples especially would have to understand and, and manage expectations because that to me is the single biggest reason why marriages fail today anyway, aside from what I've often called as the big three, uh, uh, substance abuse, spousal abuse, and uh, adultery. Um, besides those, and, and I dealt with, to be honest with you, not as many of those as you might think, most marriages that I have come across that end up uh, ending have been because they've had unrealistic expectations about their spouse. They had this middle picture that their spouse was going to be X, and they found out their spouse was human and was never going to get to X, and so that ended up being a little bit of a problem. So what I used to do in, in premarital counseling, what I used to do in these seminars, especially if there were young married couples uh, who, who just gotten married, uh, I would have them look at each other and I would tell them to gaze into each other's eyes, and then I would tell them this. I would say, this person that you love, this person in whom, whose eyes you are staring right now, I can tell you one thing about them. They will let you down. They will let you down. How do I know that? Because they're a human being, and we are wired to let people down. That is who we are. That is part of our sinful nature. Now, I wasn't, again, I wasn't trying to tell them that so they wouldn't get married or think it was all over. I was trying to tell them so that when that happened, they would come to understand that if they're believers, then God's going to give them the peace to be able to understand that and to be able to live through it. We're not, because we're not, here's the cool thing about it. Remember what I said at the beginning, that God gives us the peace to not be afraid of, of persecution and suffering and pain and pandemics and death. You know the interesting thing about that? is he never says those things won't happen. <laughs> As a matter of fact, he says the exact opposite. They're all going to happen. So it's not a lack of those things that give us peace. It's the peace that gets us to understand those things in the first place. So the circumstances can never dictate our peace. Our peace has to give us the ability to understand and interpret our circumstances. And so when you understand that people will let you down, that's, that's a huge thing that we have to grasp onto, that we have to understand. And it is no fun, by the way. The reality is most of the times it's small things, but sometimes it's not. People will betray you. They will let you down because they're human beings. You will betray people. You will let them down. We have all done this. How in the world? Because it is so difficult to get past that. Like I said, that's why so many marriages end in divorce today, because they had this understanding. They thought, I, I remember this one kid was coming into my office, and, uh, and he said, uh, hey, hey, chaps, I've got one goal for my marriage. And I thought, hey, good, we're heading in the right direction. At least he's got one, right? So I said, okay, partner, tell me what your one goal for your marriage is. And he said, that's to uh, ensure my wife stays happy all the time. So I said, yeah, here, here's the deal about your one goal. You're probably going to hose that up before you get home tonight. You can't make, you can't be responsible for somebody else's happiness. You can contribute to it and you can detract from it, but you cannot be responsible for it. We can never get to a point where we think another person can be responsible for my happiness or my joy or anything like that. Kimberly, my, my bride of, of 30 years, wow, coming up close to 30, 31 next month, um, is, is the best thing that God has ever given me. I, I hope I'm the best thing that God has ever given, apart from our salvation, obviously, the best thing that God has, has given her. Uh, but I have let her down. She has let me down. Now, we've been very blessed. They've been, they've been small things. 
But the reality is the only way we get past all of those things is the peace that God has given us to begin with. I, I know marriages make it without God, but I'll be honest with you, I don't see how they do. I really don't. It's really extraordinary when we come to understand that we have people around us all the time who will let us down, who will betray us, and yet God gives us the peace to be able to live and even thrive, because, even though in the face of people who betray us and the people that we have betrayed. Jesus said, rejoice when people betray you and persecute you because of me. Rejoice because it's for me. They're doing that because of me. How extraordinary is it that he gives us the ability and the peace to be able to live in a world that is constantly trying to let us down and constantly trying to betray us. And lastly, we can have peace in the midst of failures. Listen to these verses here in 23, verses 23 through 29 of Ecclesiastes 7. I turned my heart to know and to search out and to seek wisdom and the scheme of things and to know the wickedness of folly and the foolishness that is madness. And I find something more bitter than death. The woman whose heart is snares and nets and whose hands are fetters. He who pleases God escapes her, but the sinner is taken by her. Behold, this is what I found, says the preacher. And the preacher is Solomon. While adding one thing to another to find the scheme of things which my soul has sought repeatedly, but I have not found. One man among a thousand I found, but a woman among all these I have not found. See, this alone I found, that God made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. I want you to think about this. Look at the things in those passages that Solomon says he failed at. He's making it very clear to us the things that he failed at. And here they are. He failed at obtaining wisdom on his own. He failed to obtain knowledge on his own. He failed at having a relation, a, a real good relationship with a, with a female on his own. He failed at figuring out how the world works on his own. And he failed at making and succeeding at his plans on his own. Every single one of us has failed. Every single one of us. And every single one of us will continue to fail in some way, shape, or form. We have failed as kids. To our parents, we have failed as spouses, we have failed as parents, we have failed at work, we have failed at play, we have failed in life. And in and of itself, failure is not a bad thing, but what happens is those failures, especially if they're related to us as believers and the failures we have when we feel like we've failed God, that's a whole different story and that's when it begins to get exacerbated and that's when it begins to wear on us. But this understanding and, and, and this idea of God giving us peace in the midst of a failure is extremely, extremely important. Look who was writing this book. Look who's writing this letter of Ecclesiastes. Solomon. I don't know if we can go all the way back to the very first message I preached about this book. But it was an introduction to Solomon. Solomon is arguably one of the wealthiest, wisest, and most accomplished persons who has ever walked on this planet. Think about that for a second. One of the wisest, wealthiest, most accomplished persons who has ever walked on this planet. And when he had the chance to sit down and write about the things that have impacted him the most, he did not brag about his accomplishments. He lamented his failures. How amazing it was still bugging him, especially because it was enveloped under the umbrella of ultimately failing God of having his heart turned away from God when he married his 600 wives and had his 300 concubines. And the scripture says they all turned his heart away from the Lord. He did the opposite of what God wanted him to do and the, predict and the outcome was predictable. It's what always happens to him and us when we do the opposite of what God has called us. We fail. And you see the scripture is full of failures over and over and over again. Peter, we go. And here's the thing. And this is the, what I hope we will we'll ultimately take away from this. God already knows we're going to fail him. He already knows. He knew David was going to commit adultery and he was going to commit murder and yet he called him a man after his own heart. Jesus knew Peter was going to not deny that he even knew who he was and yet he called that humble fisherman to a place of supreme salvation and authority within the disciples. God knows we are going to fail him. You, you understand that, right? If he didn't know that, then he wouldn't be much of a God. He has known every single failure I was going to do from the time I was born till the time I'll draw my last breath on this planet. And he called me anyway. 
He loved me anyway. He saved me anyway. He died for me anyway. He rose again for me anyway. He redeemed me anyway. That's the extraordinary part about all of this. This idea of not being worn down by the things that we've done and the failures that we have engaged in. We can only do that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and with the peace that God has given us. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 through 14, Paul writes this. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do know, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Forgetting what lies behind, that is impossible for us to do. The things that we have done to fail Him are impossible for us to forget. He's forgotten them, but we haven't. How do we do that? How do we do what Paul just said? Forgetting what lies behind and moving on forward to what God has called me to do. We can only do that through the peace that He has given us. And how does He do that? He shares that with us in one of the most extraordinary series of verses in all of the Scripture. Romans chapter 3. Verses 21 through 26. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood, to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He had passed over former sins. It was to show His righteousness at the present time so that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. I will tell you, this is, this is a kind of a bold thing for, for probably for me to say and I'll probably end up regretting it at some point in my life, but that's okay. Um, if I had to pick a few verses... In all of Scripture, if I had the chance for just a few verses, if somebody said, look, I'll give you five verses. Give me five verses that explain to you, to explain to me what Christianity is all about, what God actually, had, you, you claim through His Word, He's actually done. I would pick Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 26. It is, in a nutshell, the entirety of the Gospel. And what that passage says is the righteousness that belongs to Christ. When I come to faith in Him, not because of anything that I've done, but because of every single thing that He has done for me. When I come to faith in Him, the righteousness that belongs to Jesus is placed on me. That's how you live with your failures. Because God doesn't see our failures. He looks at me in my weakness, in my corruptibility, in my struggles, in every, even in my success, everything. He, when he looks at me, he does not see me. He sees the righteousness that belongs to his son. A covering has been placed over me. I, I, that, those, I don't have the words. I don't have the words to describe what that means to me. I, I, I can't communicate it any better than those words just did. He justified me, He saved me, and He placed His righteousness on me. And He gives me rest. In Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 29, Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Again, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 29. When he gives me that, he gives me peace to live with injustice, sin, betrayal, and failure. He gives me that rest. When I think of peace, I think of rest. I am able to rest. Even though I've sinned, I can still rest because he has forgiven me and has redeemed me, has saved me and put his righteousness on me. 
When the world around me sins, I can rest. When I am confronted with every aspect of evil around me, when I am persecuted, when I am maligned, when I am mocked, it doesn't matter. None of that stuff matters. Nothing matters but Him. That is peace. I'm not afraid of anything. And that has nothing to do with me but because His Spirit lives in me. Because I know, as I said before, I know that if the worst thing that happens to me, most everybody on the planet would agree, the worst thing that could probably possibly happen to you is for you to die. Again, self-preservation is a very strong drive in all of us. I know that if the worst possible thing happened to me, I will be better off than I have ever been one single of the best day of my life on this planet. Because of the peace that He's given me, the ability to be able to rest in Him, to rest from injustices, to rest from failures, to rest from betrayals, and more than anything else, to rest from sin. Not because we don't do it or because it's not a big deal, but because He has forgiven and forgotten it forevermore because of His death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, just, just extraordinary to be able to have that peace and the ability to rest in Him. Let's pray. Father God, I thank You so much for these words. I thank you so much for what you are teaching me through the study of this amazing letter written 3,000 years ago. Most people consider something that written that long ago would have nothing to do with us in any way, shape, or form. And yet it is as relevant now, you may can argue even more relevant now than it was then when he wrote it. Because now we're looking at it through the lens of the cross and the empty tomb. Now we're looking at it through the prism of Christ. Lord, I would like to, and I do, I pray for a lot of things on this planet. There are a lot of things. You and I have had, had conversations, and there are things I've asked you for, and sometimes you've given them to me, and sometimes you've said no, and you're perfectly within your right to do that. And I know when you tell me no, it's because of my good. It's for my good, for my benefit. But one thing I want from you, almost more than anything else, is peace. The peace that transcends Happiness, the peace that transcends sadness. It doesn't matter how happy I am. It doesn't matter how sad I am. It doesn't matter how frustrated I am. Emo those emotions don't matter. Your peace supersedes all of that. I can be the happiest guy in the world and have your peace, and I can be the saddest guy in the world and have your peace. And Lord, I've been both of those. And I thank you. I think of all the things you could have given us in abundance on this planet while we are living the lives you have called us to live, that one of the most extraordinary is peace. I thank you for that. And I pray that as we wrap up here and finish here and get ready to go and do whatever it is that we're going to do, that we will be able to communicate your love, your grace, your mercy, and your salvation to a world that desperately needs to hear it because they desperately need your peace. And the only peace that can have any effect in this world in any way, shape, or form. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for uh, showing us, giving us your word. And thank you for revealing us the truth. For it's in the precious name of Jesus I pray. Amen. I, I will tell you this. Uh, you, I, I'm really going to be sad when we leave Ecclesiastes. It's going to be kind of hard to top this after we get done. What an extraordinary series of messages that this has been. Not my messages, by the way. They're all, those are all, they're his. The truth, is that, uh, the truth that he is, he is passing on to us here are, are just unbelievably uh, amazing. And I hope that you are seeing that. I hope this has been a blessing to you and that uh, you will be able to take this to heart. And, uh, and if you're a believer, if you've come to faith in Christ, there's no reason to be afraid. Not because I said so, but because Jesus said so. That's why he gives us his peace, he said, so that we would not be afraid. And he didn't qualify it by saying, well, you couldn't be afraid, you shouldn't be afraid of this, that, or the other. He just says, so you won't be afraid of anything. There is no reason for any of us to fear anything as long as we have him. For those of you who are watching who may not have received, received Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, you don't know what this salvation thing about, and my prayer is that God will open your heart and your mind and that you will come to the point where you will embrace and receive the free gift of salvation that He has offered to you, the propitiation, the salvation, the forgiveness of sin, and the peace that only He can give because of the cross and the empty tomb. As always, I'll finish up. As I always do, um, if you have any questions about that, if you have any questions about salvation, if you have any questions about anything that we've talked about, please feel free to reach out to me. There are a myriad of ways for you to connect with me, and I will be glad to talk to you uh, as long as need be, as often as you would need for that. 
to happen. So that uh, settles it for today. Again, we're just hopefully just a few weeks away from getting back together. I'm excited about that. Please be in prayer for us as we continue to make these decisions and, 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 uh, and, and get everything set up so that we can, uh, we can get that uh, going and headed in the right direction here very soon. It's an honor to spend time with you here this morning. And as always, keep reading God's Word.